Hi, I'm Michael Whitehouse, and this is Seeking the Truth. As it is December, and Christmas is coming up, it seems appropriate to talk a bit about Jesus in general terms. This week we're going to be talking about Jesus as a man and as a rabbi and his teachings, and next week we'll be talking about Jesus as a divine figure and the importance of the crucifixion and the resurrection and what that really means, because it's a very misunderstood concept. As you likely are already aware, Jesus was born to Joseph and Mary in the town of Bethlehem. Jesus is actually the Greek name for Joshua. So Jesus was actually known as Joshua ben Yosef, Joshua, son of Joseph, during his life. He wasn't known as Jesus until later when the Greeks renamed him Jesus Christ, Jesus meaning Joshua, Christ meaning the Messiah. Some people ask if Jesus Christ was in fact a real person who really lived. He was definitely a real person and definitely really lived. There are as many primary sources, if not more, about the existence of Jesus as there are about Julius Caesar. So, if Julius Caesar lived and you believe in him, you should believe that Jesus Christ also existed and had a ministry in Israel. The Bible tells us about his birth and the three wise men and all that, then is silent on the next 30 years, and then, after that, he went somewhere. He probably wasn't just hanging out for... 20 years, waiting until the Bible to pick up when he's 30 and suddenly has a ministry. It is speculated that during that time he went to the east and traveled through Persia, India, Tibet, that area, because there's some eastern concepts that he brings in during his teachings in the later part. Of course, most of the Bible is about his ministry between when he's 30 and 33, when he goes around and teaches um, some ideas that at the time were considered fairly heretical. They were very much against the grain. Uh, he was a, a radical, you could say. When Jesus started his ministry, he went around Israel and Jerusalem and that whole area and talked to people about a new way to look at God. God from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, was a very stern God. He tended to punish people for very slight transgressions. There were a lot of very strict rules in the Bible. You may have heard of Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus is often used to justify why the Bible is against homosexuality. Leviticus also said things like, don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish, don't wear cloth that is made of multiple fibers, do not be in physical contact with a woman who is on her period, and all kinds of other things which we no longer follow. So you like to know of many of Jesus' miracles. He healed the sick, he healed the lepers, he gave the blind their sight. He, with Lazarus, Raise the dead. That also contains the shortest verse in the Bible, the entirety of which is Jesus wept. Very popular among Catholic school children have to memorize a verse of the Bible. But there's another story which is a little bit lighter. Jesus was at a wedding. And a wedding is a religious ceremony, but it's also a celebration. It's a party, just like it is today. And it might have been a bigger deal then, because they didn't really have nightclubs and whatnot 2,000 years ago. So weddings and these kinds of events were some of the big events, but they didn't have any wine there. So Jesus took the water, and he said, you know, God is sometimes very serious, and sometimes decides the fate of nations, but sometimes God feels like you should just have a good time. And he took the water, and poof, he turned it into wine, and said, eat, drink, and be merry, and enjoy the gifts that I have given you. I, the divine, the almighty, the creator of all things, have also given you wine so you can enjoy these things. Another story I'd like to discuss is from the book of John. This story is a bit more serious, a bit heavier, and it shows not only the wisdom of Jesus, which is discussed quite a bit, but also his craftiness. You don't really tend to think of Jesus as a smooth political operator, but that's really what he had to be in the environment he was operating in. He was expressing beliefs that were very new and very dangerous to some people. The Pharisees were the high priests of, of Israel at the time, and they felt that Jesus was dangerous not just to them, but also to the people of Israel. They were worried that he would bring down the attention of the Romans on them, which wouldn't be good for anyone. So they would often try to catch him and trick him into saying things that proved inconsistencies, or to get him to actively come out against the old Jewish laws, 
all of which would have demonstrated that he was no one you should be listening to. The Pharisees kind of remind me of villains in Saturday morning cartoons who keep coming back every week with some new scheme with which to foil the hero, and yet the hero is always somehow able to get around them. Of course, generally in Saturday morning cartoons, the series finale does not involve the villain succeeding and the hero being sacrificed, but that we'll discuss later. The story starts with Jesus in the temple. Now, Jesus was a rabbi, and that means that he preached and counseled and taught. And the Pharisees brought in a woman they'd caught in the act of adultery. They'd walked in, they'd seen her doing it, there's no question she was guilty, and they brought her to Jesus. And, of course, they reminded him that the law, as set down in Leviticus, said that an adulteress would be stoned to death. They expected that they were giving Jesus two options. Option one is that he could say, yes, you caught her, that's the law, she must be stoned to death. Option two is that he could say, no, that law is unjust, the law that you have in the Bible, handed down from God, is incorrect, you should change it. This would have given the Pharisees the chance to say, wow, you're an arrogant guy. No one should listen to this guy. He's telling us we should throw out the Bible. Not a popular move, then or now. Jesus, however, was crafty, as I said. If Jesus was not a smooth political operator, you never would have heard of him because the people in power would have found a way to get rid of him long before books were ever written about him. He chose option three. His choice was to say, yes, absolutely, the law of God is that she must be stoned to death. So, indeed, let's stone her. Whoever among you has no sin, the most sinless one among you, not the most sinless, the one with no sin whatsoever, pick up a stone and throw it, and we'll all follow suit. And one by one, they're all like, oh, boy, oh, look at the time, wow, no sin, eh? Mm. And one by one, they left. And Jesus turned to her and said, didn't someone accuse you of something? And she said, uh, no, sir, I, I don't think there's anyone here accusing me of anything. And Jesus said, yeah, I'm inclined to agree. There's no one here accusing you of anything. So, go on your way, and... Don't sin anymore. Very crafty solution. Because Jesus wasn't just all miracles and prophecies. He also just was a really smart guy, which is why people followed him around, why people were so dedicated. And even if he wasn't a son of God, because, of course, there's some dispute over this. Christians believe he's the son of God and that he's the Messiah. But others, Jews, Muslims, many other people, believe that he was simply a very wise man. And if, in fact, he didn't perform the miracles described in the Bible, there's still 12 people who followed him around, all of whom died terrible, violent deaths because they refused to renounce Jesus. So there must have been something about him that was pretty exciting. So next week, we're going to be discussing the divine aspect of Jesus and the meaning of the crucifixion, which is often a very misunderstood concept. You've probably seen, Repent! The end is near! But that might as well be in Greek for as much sense as it makes to the average person. So we'll be discussing that, and the week after, we are going to be discussing the story of Adam and Eve, and what that teaches us about national drug control policy and sexual education. I thank you again for watching. My name is Michael Whitehouse, and this is Seeking the Truth. To get worried, try not to turn on to problems that upset you. Don't you know everything's alright? Yes. But his craftiness. Uh, this one actually 